I so Trevor's got seven warts. I know, because I counted them. Ouch! Hey there guys, Nordic Warrior here, welcome back to my video game review series. So those of you who have been following my channel will know that I've been reviewing every Harry Potter video game. Last time out, I reviewed Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone for the Xbox, which as I mentioned in that review is practically identical to the PS2 version. Today we're going to be looking at the sequel, which actually came out before it, yeah I know it's pretty complicated. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, released in 2002, developed by Eurocom. For those of you who don't know, I also reviewed the PS1 version earlier in the series, so be sure to check that one out if you want to. For this particular review, we're going to be looking at the PS2 version. Just so that you guys know, I will be reviewing the Xbox version at a later date, because contrary to popular belief, both versions are actually very different. So we're going to be looking at that version separately sometime down the line. Suffice it to say, I personally prefer the PS2 version, and there are a few interesting differences, but I digress. So this game is extremely interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, with the game being released in 2002, being the first Harry Potter game to be released on that generation of consoles, it definitely had a lot riding on it, and the developers really had to make something special for the next generation. As good as the PS1 Potter games were, and as much fun as people had with them, they were definitely a bit dated by early 2000s standards, and more of the same just wasn't going to do. So in a way, this game really had to set the standard for all Harry Potter games going forward, and it certainly did. One of the things that you'll notice about this particular Harry Potter game is that for a 2002 early PS2 game, this game was incredibly ambitious, particularly when you consider that it's technically a movie licensed game, meaning that it can't have had a particularly long development cycle. In fact, it's pretty well known that it didn't. This game had a lot of problems in development, and it could have easily turned out to be a situation where the developers bit off a bit more than they could chew. Fortunately though, despite some minor technical issues here and there, and a general lack of polish in some areas, this game is actually one of the best and most underrated games in the Harry Potter series. And like I said, it set the standard for all Potter games going forward. So the game is a third person open world action adventure RPG based on the Chamber of Secrets. Unlike the PS1 games which were more linear platformers, this was of course the first Harry Potter game to incorporate open world sandbox style gameplay. Just like in the PS1 version, you start off the game in the burrow, which is the home of the Weasleys, where you get a short tutorial. You ready to do a bit of denoming then Harry? Well, I'm not sure, Ron. I've been with the Dursleys so much this summer, I'm a little rusty. You get to help the Weasleys perform several chores around the garden, such as denoming, which returns in this version. <laughs> Once again, you can earn a higher score by hitting certain targets, and you can unlock wizard cards again doing this. Again, just like in the PS1 version, you get an epic boss battle, against Harry's true arch nemesis. Arthur Weasley's automatic washing machine. Once you're done here, you get to traverse Diagon Alley. Here you get more of an introduction into the game's exploration, dialogue and RPG elements, as well as combat, stealth, and hunting for collectibles. You help Jenny find some of her stuff, scattered in various locations in Diagon Alley, and can even visit several shops, including the Leaky Cauldron, where, surprise surprise, Hagrid is getting pissed as usual. Hello Harry, I saw Mrs Weasley looking for you. Hope you ain't been creeping round that nocturne alley. Terrible place. Once you're done in Diagon Alley, the game starts to get a bit weird. So right after you finish helping Ginny accumulate all her stuff, Ginny and Mrs Weasley just leave. And as soon as they leave, Ron shows up to inform Harry that the two of them have missed the train. Harry, we've missed the train! Missed the train? Yes! The Hogwarts Express left five minutes ago! Oh no! What are we going to do? 
So yeah, Ginny and Mrs. Weasley just abandon Harry and Ron in Flourish and Blots and leave them, leading to Harry and Ron having to make their own way to Hogwarts. You also get introduced to Gilderoy Lockhart in this scene. Prominent position as the world's most popular wizard. Harry? Oh. But weirdly enough, he's not in this game much. In fact, he's hardly in the game at all. In the PS1 version, Lockhart played more of a predominant role, and there was even a boss battle against him. Here he's barely even in the game, and he just seems to disappear midway through. Just like in the PS1 version, after leaving Diagon Alley, you get a boss battle against the Whomping Willow on the school grounds. Once the Whomping Willow is defeated, and Harry enters Hogwarts, that's when the game really begins. Much of the game is spent with Harry going about his school days, and attending various lessons. Just like in the other Harry Potter games, you will learn several different spells throughout the game, each serving their own purpose. As usual, you start the game off with Flipendo, the knockback jinx that constitutes the majority of the game's combat. This can be used to take out enemies, knock certain enemies to the ground, and can also be used to activate certain switches. You'll learn most of the other spells by attending lessons in Hogwarts, and finding the relevant spellbook in particular challenge areas. You find the Lumos spellbook in Borgen and Burks right before you get to Diagon Alley. The Ministry of Magic is conducting more raids, and I have a few more uh, items like this at home that might embarrass me. Items that you are willing to sell? Yeah, for some reason, Lucius Malfoy is embarrassed by the fact he owned the Lumos spellbook and wants to sell it for some reason. Nonetheless, Harry finds it and... This spell can be used to light up dark areas, to help you avoid traps and hazards. It can also be used to locate and unlock certain secrets, as well as to ward off ghosts that try to attack you. You have a Lohamora that can be purchased from Fred and George's shop, that can be used to unlock certain doors, as well as certain chests that contain collectibles. You have Scourge that clears ectoplasm out of your way, and once again, this can be used to unlock secret areas and certain collectibles in chests. You have Expelliarmus that can be used to deflect offensive spells from enemies, and can even be used in several wizard duels. You have Defindo that can be used to cut things such as tapestries, which often hide certain secrets and collectibles, as well as obstacles in your way. You have Avifors that, just like in the PS1 version of Philosopher's Stone, can be used to transform certain statues to get them out of your way. And you also have Incendio, once again just like in the PS1 version, that can be used to burn things, and clear things out of your way such as spider webs, and can even be used in combat against spiders and fire crabs. So many different spells to learn that each serve their own purpose in the game, and help to keep the game feeling fresh throughout. As far as the lessons go, these are quite fun and quite varied. Each spell learning lesson will have a challenge level for you to complete. These challenge levels serve as a way for Harry to earn each spell by overcoming several different obstacles and defeating enemies. Simply make your way through each challenge level and reach the end while obtaining the spellbook along the way. Got it. Spellbook. Some of these challenges are very creative and I personally had a lot of fun with them. Although I like the fact that in the Philosopher's Stone game, these challenge areas had several hidden collectibles in them, as well as more of an incentive to replay them. But I actually do prefer the challenges themselves in this game personally. For some reason, I just think they're a little bit more well designed here. They each have their own visual style and aesthetic. They also look very different from the rest of Hogwarts. You also have to attend flying class with Madame Hooch that introduces you to the overall flying mechanics. Once you reach a certain point in the game, Harry will be given a broomstick and this can be used to help explore the grounds and the rooftops of Hogwarts. Seriously, flying around the exterior of Hogwarts on your broomstick is really badass. It's really fun to do and it's also necessary to reach some of the mini-games, challenges and collectibles. More on those later. In addition to the flying and free roaming sections of the game, you also get to play Quidditch at certain stages of the game, playing against the other house teams. Quidditch is actually a little bit more challenging this time, and less simplistic than in the PS1 version, but still pretty easy. I won every single game without too much effort. They still mostly consist of Harry flying through rings and racing against another Seeker to catch the Snitch first, 
Aesthetically though, these Quidditch matches look much better and I really enjoyed them. The game has plenty of level and location variety. Some levels are brighter and more vibrant, while others are darker and more gloomy. For example, the intro in the burrow is very bright and upbeat, as well as Diagon Alley. You also get to explore the Hogwarts grounds at different times of the day. During the day, the castle is populated by students, and the grounds are very bright and vibrant. At night time, all the students are in bed and the school will be much more quiet, with several prefects patrolling each floor that Harry will have to sneak past. The grounds will be crawling with guy trashes and the overall tone and atmosphere will be much darker and much more unsettling than before. Each of the challenge areas are quite varied too. You also get several pretty unique sections of the game such as the Forbidden Forest where you have to go there and fight giant spiders en route to Aragog's lair to clear Hagrid's name as well as the finale in the Chamber of Secrets which is quite dark and mysterious but for some reason much shorter and less interesting than in the PS1 version. The game has plenty of enemy variety. For example, you take on imps, gnomes, ghosts, which sadly can't be defeated in this game. They can only be warded off using lumos. Fire crabs, that crap fire, giant spiders and guy trashes. You also have several stealth sections in the game. I mentioned before how at night time you will have to sneak past prefects and this can really give you a rush. It's a really fun stealth mechanic. You can distract prefects using spells and slow them down using stink pellets. If a prefect catches you, he will deduct five house points from you. Ah, Mr. Potter breaking the rules. Five house points from Gryffindor. There's actually a hilarious section of the game where you use Polyjuice Potion and Harry transforms into Goyle in order to sneak into the dungeons and get information from Malfoy. Oh, you must have some idea who's behind it all you know i haven't goyle how many times do i have to tell you but i know one thing during this section you can get caught on purpose and the prefix will actually deduct five house points from slytherin instead of gryffindor it's really funny hey you you shouldn't be out at night five points from slytherin this also leads to some absolutely hilarious dialogue. Anyway, uh, Draco, I'd best be going. Going where? Uh, to the hospital wing. Yes, that's it, the hospital wing. I've got a stomachache and I need to get something for it. Get going, Goyle, before your fat belly explodes! Speaking of dialogue, the voice acting in the game, just like all the Harry Potter games, is pretty funny and really quirky. You may believe, Potter, that everyone at Hogwarts is impressed with your so-called heroics in the Chamber of Secrets. The game has plenty of collectibles to find, as well as pretty cool mini-games and challenges. You find Bertie Bot's Every Flavor Bean scattered around the game, and these act as currency. You can visit Fred and George, who have set up a shop in a disused bathroom, just like in the Philosopher's Stone game, and they will have various things for sale, such as rare wizard cards and various other useful items. Speaking of wizard cards, there are so many, once again, scattered all over the game, and many of them can be found hidden in pretty discreet locations around the castle, and some of them will even be locked off to you until you obtain the necessary spell to unlock them. Others can be obtained by completing challenges and mini-games for certain NPCs around the castle. For example, you have several broomstick races that you can compete in around the school against other students. Each of these students will have three separate races for you, and they will charge a certain amount of beans for you to take part in them. These can be quite challenging, but they're not too hard. I had a lot of fun with them personally. You also have gnome tossing, just like at the burrow, where once again you get to throw gnomes in exchange for wizard cards. Some of these gnome tossing challenges have you throwing gnomes through rings, some of which move, to try and score as many points as possible. Score enough points and you will gain a wizard card. There are several of these that you can find and take part in in the grounds, mostly on the roofs of Hogwarts. 
Once again, these can be quite challenging, but not too hard, and I had a lot of fun with them. Just like the broom races, they cost a certain amount of beans to take part in. Some of them are incredibly extortionate. In addition to these challenges, you will also have items that have been lost by other students. Read the notice board in the Gryffindor common room, and you will be tasked with finding one of these items. Find them and return them to the notice board, in exchange for a wizard card. If there are wizard cards you are missing, then you can speak to certain students around the castle, who will be willing to trade wizard cards with you, and this can help you find the ones you need to complete a whole set. Once again, this is a lot of fun to do. I really enjoyed completing all these challenges and hunting for collectibles. It really gives you an incentive to explore the whole game and keep you playing long after completing the main story. The game has several pretty cool boss battles. For example, you take on the Washing Machine, the Whomping Willow, Malfoy, who you take on twice, later with Crab and Goyle, Aragog, and of course an epic final boss battle with the Basilisk. You also get a boss battle at the end of each challenge level against a gargoyle, but these are pretty much the same every time. You basically play tennis with them using Expelliarmus, and I have a feeling that each challenge level was originally supposed to have a unique boss battle, but maybe they just ran out of time to make them. So that pretty much sums up my thoughts on the Chamber of Secrets on the PS2. It's a great game for the most part, but one issue I do have, which I alluded to early in the video, is that the game has a few technical issues, and a general lack of polish. For example, the game has some very long loading screens. Pretty much every door you go through leads to a loading screen, and the game also has some frame rate issues, as well as some graphical glitches. Just like in the Philosopher's Stone game, the camera is a bit of a problem too, but not terrible, it just takes a bit of getting used to. But aside from these technical issues, I think it's a great game. The technical issues just hold it back a little bit, I give the game a solid 7 out of 10. It's a great game for the most part, and I really enjoyed replaying it. So yeah, I personally think that a solid 7 out of 10 is a fair score. Thanks for watching, guys. Stay tuned for my next review, where we're going to be looking at the spin-off game in the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup, as well as many more retrospective video game reviews. Let me know what you guys think. Thanks for watching, and God bless. It is with great pleasure that I present the House Cup to Gryffindor. Yeah!